It's a real privilege to be with you. For those of you who don't know me, it wasn't the mid 80s. You're making me appear older than I am, Jeff. It was, I was in Southport from 1988 to 1994 and then moved up to Carlisle where we've lived ever since and uh, just retired after 29 years leading the church there. Um, so this is only the second time I've preached since Christmas. So it's a real joy to be with you. I preached last week in our uh, church back home in the two, both services and now here with you. So it's a joy to be with you. Um, you've got a lot happening for such a small church, haven't you? It's, uh, and I also listened to the podcasts before I came because I knew nothing about you really, just a little bit. And uh, you've had some good preachers. So I just want to fulfill that word of Jesus this morning. The poor have you with you always, all right? So um, you don't have to expect anything quite so much as perhaps you've had in the past. Um, I have to say to you, you know, these are my disclaimers before I start. I don't get invited many places these days and w <laughs> there was no need to be sympathetic. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> You'd be sympathetic about the next part, which is that those places I do go, there's only, I think, one church that's ever had me back a second or third time. So, uh, you know, this could be the only time I'm ever among you. So uh, make of it what you will. Let me take you to the book of Jonah, if I may, this morning. I want to talk about Jonah chapter four, but let me give you an outline first of the story so far. I guess you're pretty well up on it, most of us if we've been in any church circles for any length of time, know about the book of Jonah. So Jonah is given this commission to go and preach to Nineveh. Instead, he goes in the exact opposite direction and heads for Joppa, Jaffa, where the oranges come from. And uh, he uh, eventually sets sail from there and over into chapter two. If chapter one illustrates his disobedience, chapter two, illustrates his deliverance because he's eventually thrown overboard at his own desire really to sweat to stop the storm and to affect the ship sinking and the sailors being affected by that he's swallowed up by a big fish and in the belly of the fish he meets with God again and there's that great uh, psalm of praise really and he says you know those who Trust in idols, forsake the grace that could be theirs. And he comes to that point of repentance. He's delivered, he's delivered literally onto the shore by the fish. And he then um, goes and preaches in chapter three. Chapter one, disobedience. Chapter two, deliverance. Chapter three, he preaches his declaration to Nineveh. He preaches the shortest sermon in the Bible, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. And they repent. And revival breaks out in godless Nineveh. And Jonah, in chapter 4, is upset about it. And so we're going to pick up in chapter 4 the reading from Jonah, chapter 1 and verse 4. And I've just lost it in my phone. Just bear with me one second. I had it all organized, and then there's chapter 4, verse 1. What did I say? 1, verse 4. I'm getting old. I'm getting old. Uh, Jonah, chapter 4, and verse 1. Jonah 4, 1 says this. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Our Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness, one who relents from sending harm. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it's better for me to, live than to die than to live. Then the Lord said, is it right for you to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. There he made himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But as morning dawned the next day, God prepared a worm and so damaged the plant that it withered. And it happened when the sun arose 
that God prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself and said, it's better for me to die than to live. Then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he said, it is right for me to be angry even to death. But the Lord said, you've had pity on the plant for which you have not labored nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left and much livestock? I don't know what the population of Southport is these days, but I guess it's around 120,000 people who don't know their right hand from their left. And, uh, uh, you know, people need the Lord. They need the gospel. And Jonah is so caught up with himself. If chapter 1 was disobedience, chapter 2 was his deliverance, chapter 3 was his declaration, chapter 4 is his disappointment. He's disappointed with God. He's sitting outside the city, counting the days, yet 40 days, counting them out, waiting for the destruction of Nineveh, which is the very thing he wants. And as he waits for God's judgment to fall, he gets angrier and angrier, and that anger is demonstrated in a number of different ways that I want to point out. And the subject of what I want to touch on today, if you want a title for today, it's disappointment with God. Because while we may not all have been called to do what Jonah did, most of us have times in our life where we want something to happen, we expect it to happen, we even have faith for it to happen, we pray for it to happen, and it doesn't. And we get disappointed. Now, the great privilege of coming and speaking into a church that I know little about and of little people is that I come and I bring you the word of God and then I tootle off up the road and you may never see me again. But it, it gives me a chance to seek the face of God. And Esme kindly said, you know, just preach whatever God said on your heart. Sorry, am I moving around too much for the camera? Um, the, uh, the thought I had right at the beginning of the week was this phrase, disappointment with God. And I don't know where you're at. I don't know your situation. I know one or two of you, but really don't know anything in the last 30 years. And uh, I don't know where you're at or what your past is or what issues you are facing, but I felt God say to me that there are those who are facing disappointment and who have a deep sense of disappointment in God. They put on a brave face, they do the things Christians do, they are saying the things that Christians say, but there is a worm of disappointment in their soul. Something that is causing them difficulty. Jonah gets angry. And in his anger, he accuses God, first of all, in those first two or three verses of chapter 4. He prays and he gets angry. And his accusation against God is really this. This is the very reason I didn't want to go to Nineveh. Because I said, you're a God of grace, you're a God of compassion, you're a God abounding in love and mercy, who relents from sending judgment. And these lot deserve your judgment. Nineveh was the rising power, the Assyrian power. They'd filled the sort of vacuum of power in that part of the Middle East at that time. They were notorious for their brutality. There was no war crimes court in those days. There was no rules of war, not that they're kept to now. But nevertheless, they were notorious for their brutality. And as a Jew, Jonah hated the Ninevites with a vengeance. You think you'd be happy that God was a God of compassion. But you see, Jonah, despite having this you know, declaration of faith and understanding of the nature of God in his head, he'd experienced it himself in chapter 2, God's grace and mercy and compassion. Instead, he's angry at God. 
Because he wants the blessing of God, but he wants others to experience God's judgment. He wants to uphold both judgment and blessing, but he's a bit unbalanced about how he holds those things in tension. He wants God's grace for him and people like him, not for people who he thinks are beyond the pale, like the Ninevites. He had a right doctrine in his mind, but his emotional response showed that what he said he believed, he didn't actually value in his life. Now, Christians are a bit like that sometimes, aren't they? We all say we believe in evangelism until it becomes us who have to share a word of testimony or witness to those we work with or those we mix with. Every Christian believes in evangelism, they just want other people to do it generally. <laughs> Every Christian believes certain things and yet sometimes they're not really our values. And when people come to faith, you can pretty soon tell what their values are. While ever they're in church with others who espouse similar values, they try and conform. But sometimes if they're out of church or there's a change of church or there's different circumstance, what happens is they revert back to old values. There hasn't been a values change in their discipleship. What there's been instead is a conformity to outward behavior. That isn't what God wants of us. He wants transformation of the heart. The new covenant is all about the law of God written on our hearts and transforming us from the inside out. He had a right doctrine, but his values really weren't the values of God. His heart wasn't the father heart of God. Neil Anderson speaks about God's red flags of warning, our emotions, that we ignore at our peril. He says, anger signals a blocked goal. Jonah wanted Nineveh destroyed. He gets angry because that goal isn't going to be realized. He says, anxiety indicates an uncertain goal. We get anxious when what we hope to happen, think might happen, want to happen, isn't really looking good. Breeds anxiety in us. Depression, he says, signals an impossible goal. It was never going to happen because of God's nature to forgive when people respond to his call to repentance. Nineveh was never going to be destroyed as soon as they respond to the preaching of Jonah. And so he gets angry, he's disappointed with God, and he gets depressed to the point of being suicidal. Talks about dying. Better for me to die than to live on a couple of occasions in that chapter. Sometimes we mask our unrealistic expectations of God as faith. And we put a face of faith upon it because we like spiritually sounding excuses for our unspiritual attitude sometimes. And we can mask wrong desires as though it's being obedience to God. I know a man, and you'll know him as well, who could have listed a whole catalogue of disappointments in his life. His friends tried to manipulate him. His wife ridiculed him and seemed on a different wavelength. His best friend was killed in an unnecessary war. One of his sons was killed by another son. And then that son, the murderer, turned against him. And that led eventually to his death. And then he got disappointed with himself as well. Not just with his family and his friends and his circumstances. He got disappointed with himself because he had an affair with somebody else's wife. That man, of course, was King David in the Old Testament. And you could have masked some of his bad decisions with spiritual sounding phrases. In fact, he probably did until he's finally confronted and that leads to his repentance. Wrong desires, unrealistic expectations, 
lead to disappointment with God. Sometimes it's our theology that does that. You know, we, we've all seen those who have a hyper-faith theology, word of faith theology, that says you will always receive blessing, you will always receive healing. And we know in reality that is not the case, yet people are masked by spiritually sounding language and buy into something that is a, a, a really bad taskmaster and causes heartache. There's an element of truth in it, of course. It's just pushed to an extreme. Jonah was disappointed with God. To Jonah, this seemed very wrong. He expects God to work the same way he thinks he should. He expects that God is going to work according to his plan and his purposes. Whatever our theology on the second coming, there's an element of surprise involved in that, isn't it? There's always going to be an element of surprise. God is going to do things that will surprise us. The older I get, the less certain I become on some things, if I'm honest. I don't mean fundamentals. I don't mean the fact that he's coming again. I don't mean some of our doctrine on that. I simply mean that God has a way of surprising me. And I'm looking for renewal, for revival, for an awakening that will probably be very different from what it was years ago. When I left Southport and went to Carlisle, we were in that season called the Toronto Blessing. We didn't see the extremes of that. We saw a tremendous renewal in the church in Carlisle. But it wasn't what I'd hoped. It wasn't an awakening. It wasn't lost people coming to faith. It was just saints getting blessed. And I don't despise that. But that can lead to disappointment also when you expect something more. It all seemed wrong to Jonah. All seemed wrong to him. Disappointment with God when he doesn't do what we want. What about healing? Have you been prayed for? Have you been sick? Have you had prayed for someone else? There's a, a guy in our church whose wife is very ill at the moment, and, and he sort of backed away from his faith when a close friend of his who was a church leader died at a fairly young age, and he so believed the man was going to be healed, and he wasn't. And he's lived for something like 10 or 15 years in disappointment. And now he finds himself in a situation where his own wife is very ill and he's come back to faith and he's believing God again. But I think there's a bit more balance this time than there was before. I like that attitude of Meshach, Shadrach and Abednego when they're tossed into the fire furnace. They come up with this great phrase in Daniel 3, 17 and 18. God, they say, is able to deliver. He's not just able, he will. But if he doesn't, <laughs> that's not an expression of doubt. That's an expression of steadfast faith. Whatever God deems right, we will trust him. We'll never bow down and worship. Jonah's accusation is simple, it isn't fair. His argument is clear. These people don't deserve God's forgiveness. He drew the line at these Ninevites who were brutal and cruel coming to a real relationship with God. I don't know where you draw the line. I know nothing about you individually. I do know that some Christians draw the line at all sorts of different places. They would say God's grace is for all but then they have one or two provisos in their mind. If a couple of homosexuals came into their church, for example. That's a challenge for us all in these difficult days. Great pastoral challenges. And we've got to maintain a biblical position while at the same time holding out the hand of love to those who are damaged and broken. Because guess what? We're broken as well in some ways. I know Christians who draw the line at deathbed conversion. They don't believe it. They hear of somebody who's come to faith on their deathbed and they get upset. As though it depended upon being good enough before you repent. And we know it isn't. The dying thief, of course. 
came to faith not on his deathbed, but on his means of execution on the cross. There are those who draw the line at some people being in church. The church is the only organization that ministers to the abused and to the abusers. And in a church of any size, there's always the possibility that there will be both within that congregation. I can tell you, without breaching any confidentiality, in our church back in Carlisle, a church of around 300 people, there are a number of people who have been convicted of sexual offences. There are a number of people who have been abused by those of, not the same people, but abused by those of sexual offences. And some people want to draw the line at, at welcoming those who have committed great acts of ungodliness in the past. And yet the grace of God says, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Where do we draw the line? Jonah wanted to be less forgiving than God. And I think sometimes Christians can be a bit like that in their language and in their actions and in their activities. What's the unforgivable sin? Well, the unforgivable sin in Scripture is very simple. It's rejecting Christ. That's the only unforgivable sin. And Christians who worry about committing the unforgivable sin, if they're worried about it, they certainly haven't. Because the Holy Spirit's prompting them. And the people who have committed the unforgivable sin generally don't care. They're totally uncaring about spiritual truth. Every sin is forgivable. It requires repentance, requires a change of attitude, requires a change of lifestyle over time. But coming to faith in Christ, we don't get washed immediately, do we? I don't know how long you've been a Christian. I've been a Christian ooh, longer than most. Not as long as Jeff, because he's older, but longer than most. Um, the fact of the matter is that there are still areas of ungodliness in my life and in my thinking and in my heart. When every secret is made bare, I'll probably be embarrassed. And when it says God will wipe away the tears of the saints from their eyes, for some of us, it'll be tears at what we've done when we've let him down. It's all of grace. None of us are good enough. Jesus died for sinners. I come to call sinners to repentance, not the righteous. And the great good news of the gospel is anyone can come to faith. And indeed, anyone can come to faith. And if that's a genuine saving faith in Christ, their life will change over time. But not immediately. Some things might change immediately. Other things will be a, an ongoing battle. And our sanctification is our cooperation with the Holy Spirit as he changes us. Jonah didn't want God to bless other nations. He saw God as a God of the Jews only. And he'd missed on that great passage given to Abraham that the Jews were intended to be a blessing to everybody else, to all the nations of the world. And he'd missed it. We live in a world that is in a mess. Without being political at all, the situation in Palestine and in Israel is a mess and needs the grace and mercy of God into that situation. Perhaps Jonah was a bit concerned that if he preached and nothing happened, people would think he wasn't really a prophet. Now, we laugh at that because, you know, that seems such a petty concern, but let's be honest, our self-esteem is often tied up with our apparent success or otherwise. I know without a shadow of a doubt as a pastor uh, that sometimes my self-esteem is tied up with how many people are coming to faith at a given point in time. How many are growing through our discipleship courses. 
how many are out on a Sunday. I've been delivered from that since December, since I retired. I don't care if there was 300 or 350 on Sunday. It doesn't bother me. I'm only in one of the services and there's a hundred odd folk and as long as my friends are there and the people I'm mixing with, different attitude. But we all have a sense of self-esteem that's sometimes tied up with our performance. And in the midst of it, Jonah did one thing right. He talked to God. However he was struggling, whatever his state of emotion, he turned to God. He kept that door open and God met with him. Whatever issue you are struggling with or I am struggling with, we've got to keep that dialogue open with Jesus. We've got to keep our open communication with him. It's always right to talk to God about it. That was just the first point. But I promise you, the second and third are much shorter. <laughs> promise you. The second thing that I wanted to mention was he suppressed his anger and that resulted in depression. You see, the flip side of anger is often depression. If we express our anger, if we're one of those people who blow up and express it, we're probably less prone to getting depressed. It may not be the right way to express it. But if we suppress it, and try and hide our anger and deny it, it reveals itself in other ways. And his disappointment led to depression. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for it's better for me to live than to die. Sorry, to die than to live. Again, Jonah is depressed enough to wish to be dead. His suicidal tendencies reveal his mental state. Incidentally, notice, there's no mention of anything demonic in that, although... Demonic activity can affect people's mental state. And those who have mental illness are sometimes more prone to the demonic. But that's not the issue here. The issue is, emotionally and mentally, he was in a mess. And his sadness led to that point. And you know, if you're not willing to say to God and argue with him sometimes, God, you're unfair, the danger is you slide into a spiral where you don't really grasp the nettle, the issue of what it is. It leads to emotional and spiritual depression. How do you deal with your anger? Five steps very quickly. First of all, try to understand the root cause of it. Anger is often just a fruit and we need to know what the root of it is. It often has fear at the root, a fear of not being thought well of, a fear of failure, a fear, perhaps for Jonah, of not being regarded as a prophet. Secondly, acknowledge your anger, see it for what it is, and confess it to God as sin and ask for forgiveness. Trouble is, it's not quite as easy as that, is it? Asking for forgiveness is free because Jesus died on the cross for our sins. But forgiveness is not the only issue because then you've got to work through the process of forgiveness, particularly if that involves other people. You've got to set your will to forgive those who have wronged you and change your thinking if necessary. Now listen, if somebody really hurts you, at the end of the day, just saying, I forgive you. We read it in Colossians, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. I think it was Greg, wasn't it, read it. And uh, uh, that's so important, but it's not just a simple exercise. Because if somebody's really hurt you, next time you see them, it rises again. Or somebody says something, it rises again. Gail and I went through a particularly traumatic issue about 12 years ago and for months afterwards we would find ourselves talking about the issue didn't matter what the conversation was it would get round to that and we had to deal with ourselves and we had in my case I actually asked somebody to hold me accountable so that I <laughs> wouldn't keep harping on about it because it didn't do me any good and it certainly didn't affect them on unduly didn't do me any good. Acknowledge your anger, set your will to forgive, ask God to help you with your angry feelings. Jonah didn't really do that. He just expressed it 
But God was a good counselor, asked him some good questions and refused to keep thinking about it. Every time it comes to mind, forgive again. Get someone who holds you accountable so that when you start harping on about it again, they poke you verbally or spiritually or in some physical way even, just so that you keep a check on your tongue and your spirit and your heart. Above all else, guard your heart for it's the wellspring of life, it says in Proverbs. Jonah didn't do those. He went and sat watching the city, waiting for it to be destroyed, wanting it to be destroyed. The third thing was he faced up to his anger because God, the great counselor, comes alongside him and asks questions. If you want good answers, you've got to ask the right questions. If you want to grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus, you've got to ask the right questions of your own soul. God comes alongside him and asks three questions that really make us face up to the issue. You know, I've had the privilege of mentoring some uh, pastors and leaders over the years. And the most important thing in that is learning to ask the right questions so that they confront the issues themselves. God comes alongside and he says three things to him. And he's wanting to bring about a change in depressed, unhappy, self-centered Jonah so that he comes in line with his father's heart. The first question, have you got any right to be angry? Yes, I've got every right, says, says Jonah. So God does this great little, you know, uh, parable, this great little illustration by letting him have a plant that shields him from the wind and from the sun and then a worm comes and kills it. And his next question is, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Yes, it is, he says. <laughs> yes, I've got every right to be angry. And God says, well, okay. He acknowledges Jonah's concern for the plant. And then his third decisive question is, if you have a, a concern for the plant, shouldn't I have a concern for 120,000 people in the great city of Nineveh? who cannot tell their right hand from their left. Now, just put yourself in Jonah's position for a moment. When God says, you know, I'm concerned for this city. They're sinners in need of a savior. What do you think about that, Jonah? What are you gonna say back to the Lord? Jonah might have said something like, God, you shouldn't be concerned. All you could be concerned with is what I'm concerned about. God, you should be like me. But he wasn't that arrogant, really, and nor will we be. He could have said, God, I really don't care what you think about Nineveh. All that matters is me and my feelings. But he knew that wasn't right either. So what do you do when the sovereign God puts his finger on the issue in your life and asks the question, what is it that really disappoints you, Jonah? Because that's what he's asking him. He's put on the spot and he realizes the weakness of his arguments. The ground's kicked away from under him and he realizes he's been petty and self-centered. Now, that's where the book ends. That's the end of it. We're not told the details of how he works that through, but we do know he did work it through because he wrote the book. He wrote the book to show how stupid he'd been so that the rest of us could learn from it. He wrote the book so that we could get it and there was no more questions needed. What is it you're disappointed in? What are the areas where God puts his finger on your life and asks the decisive question? What is it that he wants to say and to speak into your life that challenges you at the very core of your being. Because most of us have those issues in one form or another, emotionally, spiritually, doctrinally, in some area, in our thinking. In what area have we missed the heart of God? And he realizes again a fresh awareness of God's amazing presence, patience with the whole city but also with him as an individual. God wants to save Nineveh, but he takes time to deal with Jonah.
God's concerned about the whole world. He's got it in his hands. He's got his eternal purposes planned out, even though we don't see them or understand them. And he's still concerned about you and me. Amazing thought, isn't it? That when we cry out and when we pray and when we have our devotions, he promises to be with us. And if we abide in him, he promises something more than just his general presence. He says, the Holy Spirit will come and will manifest himself to you. I will manifest himself. The manifest presence of Jesus. When we're full of the Spirit and walking with him and abiding in him. The manifest presence of God. <laughs> Jonah responded. He wrote his testimony. The challenge for us is to know how we should respond. And the only way of responding starts with honestly saying to God, what is there that needs you, me to be changed? Where do I need to be changed? Bless you.